Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It's Tuesday, and I'm glad you're here. Uh, uh, welcome today. Sorry that I was out yesterday. I had to take a little catch-up day and uh, try to uh, try to get caught up. I should move things out of the out of out of view here. There's there's a problem. Trent and I were talking about that ahead of time. I can't I can't really tell what shows and what doesn't till the camera comes on. Uh, but good to um, see each one of you, like our friend Miguel down in um, the Dominican Republic, right? I get the Dominican Republic and Puerto Rico mixed up. Miguel, help me if I'm wrong there. Um, and Lenny over in London and Rudy in Belgium got an international day going on here. We even have Mississippi, ladies and gentlemen. And uh, South Carolina, and Texas, good to see people from all over the place, West Virginia, glad you're here. So I was off yesterday. I actually was, I was not off. I was in the office. I worked all day, uh, but I just had so much I had to catch up on. I thought, I am so behind. What am I going to do? And so I, um, I just decided, okay, I'll uh, let you all have a Monday off as uh, we'll uh, carry things out through that way. So sorry about that. Here we are ready for your biblical, theological, and worldview questions. I'm Randy White, and I'm your host for Ask the Theologian. We put our theological minds together, take the uh, Word of God, boil all that down into some conclusions, and that then becomes our doctrine. So doctrinal, biblical, theological, worldview questions, that's what we do here, and uh, glad you are with us. I, I have some brightness on the tie today, wouldn't you agree? Brightness on the tie. This, uh, this tie. I've been noticing it in the stack of ties, and I've been thinking, where and how am I going to wear that tie? Because it's so bright. But, you know, I don't know, looking over there at the monitor, I'm thinking it looks pretty good with the, uh, with the uh, what is that, dark blue jacket and white shirt? You can carry it off. It's the Vegas Elegance tie. You know, I decided, hey, we need a, everybody needs a Vegas tie, right? I don't know why, but uh, in case you need it, there you go. Vegas Elegance, seven ninety nine. Where are you gonna get? Where are you gonna get that tie for seven ninety nine? You know, uh, I'm not sure who this came from. I didn't. Uh, I, di- I didn't catch a name on it. But someone just said, I was looking for the Things That Differ book by Stam and see that you don't carry it. Why? I got one right here. Um, how about that? I don't know where I got it. It says it cost me 69 cents. Maybe that's why I don't carry it. I could never make any money off that. I couldn't sell it for 69 cents. <laughs> but... I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to work on getting this. Uh, the, the Fundamentals of Dispensation, Stam's got some good stuff. He, uh, uh, he comes from a rightly dividing perspective. Uh, he taught me a great deal early on. I haven't read so much of his stuff uh, lately, but he taught me uh, some stuff early on. So I, I, will, get, I will get that in. Um, and he really does a good job of... Uh, putting this together. Let's see. uh, uh, The Principles of the Dispensation of God, Prophecy and Mystery, Chapter 3, The Twofold Aspect of the Mystery. Um, He's got the unfolding of the mystery, the last days, the ministries of the Twelve, and Paul compared Peter and Paul as witnesses, Peter and Paul as builders, uh, Petrine and Pauline authority, the so-called Great Commission, good news. He's just got a a ton of stuff in here in this, I don't know, what is it, a uh, about 275-page book. 
Uh, so I am, I am going to get some of those. I'll see. You know, sometimes stamp stuff is not on, available on wholesale. So sometimes that's why I don't have it. I'll have to check and make sure I can get that on ho- wholesale because there's no sense in me paying full price and then turning around and charging you a little extra when you could get that somewhere. But uh, anyway, really is a, really is a good book. Uh, and uh, I, I don't know where I got mine for 69 cents, but... Uh, looks brand new. Who knows? If you get stamp stuff, read it. I like stamp stuff. Let's go to Thomas and Jamie up in Lilliwop. Good to see you. Lilliwop, Washington. Unlearn it or just evangelical garbage? That's, that's, that's the question that relates to this comment. You've heard it before. In essentials, unity. In non-essentials, liberty. In all things, charity. Before I read the comments that uh, come from Lily Wop, I want to uh, stop and speak about that. I think that is that uh, that particular quote, of course, has gone in various forms uh, all over the place. And I think sometimes I see it uh, attributed to, I don't know, one of the saints, uh, one of the Catholic saints, you know, like, uh, uh, I don't know, uh um, St. Francis or something like that. Uh, but I, I don't know who, uh, who actually said it. Let's, let's just break this out. Ag- again, it does. And the Lily Wap audience even says, sounds good. And it does. In essentials, unity. In non-essentials, liberty. In all things, Charity. That sounds good. Here's the problem with it as I see it. Nothing is essential. Everything gets pushed to the non-essentials. And so everything becomes liberty. Why don't we, why don't we just say something like, let's figure out what the Bible says and do it. I might be wrong. You might be wrong. But the Bible can't, the Bible doesn't have non-essentials. Which are the non-essentials in the Bible? This is, this is kind of the appendix to the Bible. It's not really the Bible. I mean, it's just the appendix to the Bible. So usually they would take things like, uh, let's say like the rapture, the, the rapture of the church. And many, many, of course, I have a Southern Baptist background where we would not have worn a Vegas elegance tie. Uh, We would have called it something else, something more spiritual. But anyway, uh, in my Southern Baptist background, you could hold to absolutely any eschatology you wanted and you'd be fine. You could graduate from the seminaries with that. You, You know, as long as you didn't have grammatical errors in your paper, you could write, uh, you know, some perverted view of post-millennialism and got an A+. Just the grammar's good and you put a few scriptures. Because in all things, in, in, in non-essentials, liberty, and this would have been a non-essential. All of the ecclesiology of the church would be non-essential. Uh, that would include, uh, uh, you know, uh, the, 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 uh, the identity and the role of the pastor, the identity and the role of the deacon, the identity and role of the elders, if you got any of those. Uh, just everything everything, ecclesiology, everything, eschatology. I would say probably even most things pneumatology. That would be, you know, the the spiritual gifts that we talked about on Sunday in the Unlearn It series. Uh, And and, uh, go on and on through most of the ologies. They're all going to be, well, that's it. That's not, well, uh, we just, in essentials, unity. Well, what's the essential? I guess God exists. Okay, you know, they, that, that statement is, is designed to not deal with the issue. I don't know why we just don't deal with the issue. I, I think, again, there is, 
there is uh, 66 books of the Bible. We rightly divide the 66 books of the Bible to know what to apply and when, and there's some, some uh, degree of debate, of course, on that that uh, needs to be had more. We need to have more debate on that instead of just acting like it's a you know normative kind of thing. Everybody knows. There's a, no, we need to have some debate on that. But, uh, you know, what, what is it that Paul teaches? Let's just go with Paul. Uh, what is it that Paul teaches that is a non-essential? Or if you don't want to talk about Paul, what is it that Jesus teaches that is non-essential? Here's the non-essential Jesus, and here's the essential Jesus over here. It, who's going to break that down? Th this is the problem with so many of these little, uh, I don't know, let's call them mantras kind of things. Uh, it, um, it just, th they break apart when you start scrutinizing them. But we live in a society that doesn't like to scrutinize anything. It would rather say, oh, that makes me feel so good. Kind of like a Vegas elegance tie. I just feel sparkly inside. And that's the kind of society we like. And I don't, I, I would rather, I don't mind a Vegas sparkly tie, but I would, uh, I would rather, let's really get down into some of these issues and deal with them and figure out, you know, even, even if it's non-essential, however we're going to define that. My guess is we could never even define that which is non-essential. But if we're going to work on that which is non-essential, uh, let's figure out what it is. And, and then let's dig down into... Uh, okay, does the Bible actually have an answer on this? Does the Bible say something? You know, if you, I, I guess the only way you could say some, some doctrine is non-essential is if by that you mean, well, you can go to heaven and still misunderstand this doctrine. In, in which case, there's a lot of non-essential doctrines. I don't think that you have to have your eschatology right or your ecclesiology right or even your pneumatology right in order to hear the gospel and receive, receive the gospel. So, you know, what, whatever, you know, what's that mean? Like Linda says, you know, Daniel, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Isaiah, non-essentials, non-essentials. We don't, we don't need this. Can, uh, what, what, what comes down to the essentials? We don't need the minor prophets, nor the books of poetry, nor the, well, nor the major prophets for that matter. And then there's just books of history. Uh, we don't need, uh, well, we just actually don't need the, new, the Old Testament. The Old Testament's non-essential. You see, there is no place to stop on the dumb statement. In essentials, unity. I suspect if we were to come over here and... Uh, Let's just, uh, let's, let's just, let's just search it in essentials, liberty in non essentials. Uh, oops, I got that wrong. Liberty, uh, in essentials, unity. Let's, let's see who's saying that when we go on to the world wide web. Oops, I pushed the wrong button. There we go. Now we go. Um, in necessiles unitas dubias libertas in omnibus caritas. See there, if we, if we say it in Latin, it, it, it sounds so much more theological, doesn't it? That's a Wikipedia article. Um, okay, uh, let's, let's jump down here. Uh, so let's, let's see if I can make that big enough for you to see. Um, Here's, uh, oh, Ligonier. Let's, let's ask Ligonier Ministries what they have to say about Ligonier, of course, is the one, it's, that's, that's the R.C. Sproul ministry who says, uh, God loves me and chose me from before the foundation of the world, but he absolutely hates you and he damned you to hell for your glory. Uh, Ligonier says, this is uh, Mark Ross from uh, Ligonier. Uh, Philip Schaff, the distinguished 19th century church historian, calls the saying in our title, the watchword of Christian peacemakers. Often attributed to a great theologian such as Augustine, it comes from otherwise undistinguished German Lutheran theologian. Okay. Uh, phrase, a little, little bit of, uh, I don't know, uh, 
history there, I guess. Might it serve us well as a motto for every church and every denomination today? I'll give an answer. No. What in the world do we need a motto for? Moving forward. Those who are united by faith in Christ thereby. United to one another in the church body of Christ. Uh, we call this union the communion of the saints. It's a mysterious thing. It tells me they, they misunderstand the body of Christ. They misunderstand saints and they misunderstand mysterious thing. Um, yeah, I don't want to read all that. Liberty. Tensions arising from diversity of belief and practice among Christians are already apparent in the pages of the New Testament and remain with us today. There was apparently a thriving vegetarian faction within the church at Rome. Uh, there was also a difference among them about whether certain days to were to uh, be honored. Uh, such a person was to be welcomed, okay? Yeah, in that le so, so I guess, okay, if you want to say in doctrine, unity in dietary preferences, liberty, in all things love. Eh, if you want to go there, okay, probably I'll go there. I'm going to have my steak. You can have your broccoli and we'll, we'll go with it, uh, if, if that's what you mean. But I, I, I think it's, a, it, it's one of those statements that just wants to boil everything down to non-essentials. The Liliwap comment says, sounds so good, but seems to be a handy excuse for not being willing to discuss all God's word given to us. We don't want to cause division in the body. Yep. I, I, I didn't read that ahead of time, but I think that's what I said. And you, you said it even better from Liliwap. Uh, yeah, we don't want to cause division. We, we don't want to cause division assuming, because that, that phrase is almost always used in theological terms, so let's just talk in the theological realm for a moment. We're not talking politics. We're not talking dietary preferences. We're not talking about whether or not you like the Vegas Vista tie or whatever it was I called it, Vegas elegance. Um, we're talking theology. We don't want to cause division really does mean we don't want to discuss it. I'd rather golf. Not, not all that interested. Yeah. That's what I think. Oh, oh, I, Edith, I haven't used that term in a while, have I? Bumper sticker theology. That's, that's what it is. It's bumper sticker theology. Bumper sticker that's gone back, I don't know, 500 years or so. It's an, it's an old bumper sticker. But, um, oh, Stephen, I, I want to give you two extra points of eternal rewards today because Stephen, Stephen down in Florida, if the Christian world would just deem the show Ask the Theologian essential, the world would be a better place. Now that I like. <laughs> Lords, did I say it right? It's good to see you. Uh, now, Nancy, I'm going to get to the next question here in just a moment, but uh, Nancy had a suggestion that's not bad. Instead of Vegas elegance, she suggested picnic in paradise. Picnic in paradise. It's the mustard tie. I could have called it the mustard seed. If I wanted to, you know, sound spiritual. Uh, but it is a tie after all, so I don't know how spiritual it is. Uh, it, 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 it's kind of a mustard color, isn't it? I called it brilliant gold. But I wish, I wish Nancy would have been here. I, I would have called it mustard. Because uh, it's, it's kind of a mustard color. I have a picture somewhere. It would take me too long to find it, so I want to, uh, of a mustard field in Israel. And just yeah, brilliant. And um, we've had some wild mustard uh, blooming around here lately here. Just very nice. Nicholas in Bolingbrook, Illinois has a question about 
pull up Biblify here. Here we go. Exodus 20, verse 13. Thou shalt not kill. One of the Ten Commandments. The interlinear has the word kill. However, my friend says the King James Version is loaded with errors. And this should be murder, not kill. Is the King James Version wrong? Let's do a couple of things to, to, to do that. I love that. Uh, that question. There are those who believe that the King James is riddled with error. By the way, uh, that the King James and translations issue are going to be the subject of our discussion at the Taos Prophecy Conference, September 21 through 24 here in Taos, New Mexico. Uh, let's, let's pull up the word kill. I want to do a Strong's word on it. Here, here's what I'm going to guess. No, I, my guess was wrong. So I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to quit guessing that. I, I can already see I was wrong. Um, let me bring this up for you. Get it uh, where you can see it very well. Okay. Thou shalt not kill. The word comes up 47 times. Manslayer, slayer, manslayer, murderer, 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 slayer, slayer, kill, slayer, murderer, put to death, murderer, slayer, kill, kill. Deuteronomy 5.17 also has it, thou shalt not kill. Slayer, slayer, slayeth, slay, 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 slain, slain, killed, murderer, murder, murder, and murder the fatherless. Okay, I was wondering if murder as a verb existed in those days. Seems like Psalm 94, 6. Let's just check that. They slay the widow and the stranger and murder the fatherless. Okay. Uh, will you steal, Je Jeremiah 7, 9. Will you steal, murder, and uh, commit adultery? Okay, so it, it goes into some of the Ten Commandments in Jer Jeremiah 7. Uh, and uh, killing and murder. Okay. Every one of these looks like to me, I think we could, um, we could, we could probably lay that out a little, a little more in those 47 times if we wanted to study it, but it looks to me like every one of those does have a malicious intent to it. It probably is a malicious intent word. So, kill... I don't know how graphic I should be here, but chipmunks are cute, but we have too many. And I have a little BB gun and it 99% of the time it whops them in the hiney it's just like one of those little CO2 kind of things. It whops them in the hiney and, and they say, we should go to the neighbors. But every now and then, it kills them. Sorry for friends of Alvin and the chipmunks uh, to bring this up in a family program. But... The, I, I think, I think probably everyone would say, 99.9% well, .9 of everyone, except for the PETA folk, would say that that does not break that particular commandment. Thou shalt not kill. It's not a malicious intent. It is a protection of your own property because they will eat your wiring up real quick. But, but, but also that's not murder. You know, it's, it's not murder. I mean, it is, it's, it, okay, you kill the chipmunk every now and then. Um, so 
the, it, it appears that King James did have the opportunity to say murder, but rather they, should, they said kill. Now, let's, let's do another thing here. Let's check kill in the English. We have 47 times the particular Hebrew word comes up. Let's check kill in the English and it comes up, okay, 126 times. Let's um, pop that out where you can see it. Uh, here we go. Uh, Genesis 4.15, the Lord said unto him, Therefore, whosoever slayeth Cain, vengeance shall be taken upon him sevenfold. And the Lord shall set a mark upon Cain, lest anyone finding him should kill him. Now, that's, that's an interesting one. Uh, let's, let's, you know, we... Well, the reason I say somebody finding him should kill him, but that's a different kill word because it didn't come up in our 47 list. So in Genesis 4.15, let's, let's just, let, let's check this out. Here, here's the Exodus passage and let's just, uh, Let's bring up Exodus uh, chapter 20. Verse 13. And where is it? That's Leviticus. Um, yeah, okay, something. Something is not right there. I told Nathan the other day, I said, something is not right in the Strong's interlinear. And indeed, something is not right. So let's, let's hop over here and uh, make this work. Uh, okay, so we are going to take the Genesis 4.15. Uh, the word kill is word 5221 kill. And it's used 348 times, slay 92, kill 20, beat 9, slaughter, goes through a whole bunch of things. And I was seeing if he had a comparison here. He does not. Uh, so that appears to be a very broad kill word from slaughter, probably with wound, with, uh, with uh, sacrifices, slay, kill, should kill him. Uh, the word slayeth up here, that's word 2026. So here we got down here, this is again Genesis 4.15, we've got uh, word number 52.21. Up here for slayeth, we've got word number 2026, and it's got the murderer, the murderer kind. Uh, that's, a, that's a murder word. Uh, and then Exodus 20, verse 15, we've got the 1589 word. So this is a total one, totally different uh, altogether. Uh, oops, I got that. Uh, thou shalt not steal. Excuse me, let's go here. Thou shalt not kill is uh, 7523, 7523. Okay. Uh, so, yeah, here we got uh, to murder, to slay, premeditated, accidental, uh, eventual. Uh, here's, here's, here's what I think. If, if your friend says, the King James is loaded with errors, it's just loaded with errors, they should have put murder. I would, I would go ahead wearing my Vegas elegance tie. I would put money down on the matter here. I thought I had a quarter, but there, there's a stack of one dollar bills right here, ladies and gentlemen. Why, there's even six of them. Six of them right there. Six one dollar bills. I would put every one of those down to say, I could take your NASB or your ESV or your Holman Christian Standard, excuse me, that one's out of date, your Christian Standard Bible, which is the updated Holman Christian Standard Bible because they messed up so many times on the first one, they decided to update it within 10 years. Uh, 
or and I don't know which NASB we're going to take. Is it the NASB, the original NASB? Is it the 95 NASB? Are we going with the, uh, well, I don't know, about 2000 NASB or whenever they, they uh, redid that one? You know, which ESV are we going to take? Which NIV? So if you'll figure out which one of the umpteen versions that we're going to take, I will just with the word kill, kill and murder, I will show that there's an unbelievable inconsistency. And I know I can do that because again, the word kill comes up, uh, I don't know, what did, what did we say? Uh, uh, 126 times in English. So I got 126 passages. I can guarantee they were not consistent in it. If you insist that there is uh, murder, there's manslaughter, there's, uh, you, you know, there's a slaying, there's what, whatever, all the different things. So I think what you've got here, and, and I would also like to study this a little more into the English language and see what, uh, what, what words were available to them. I, I'm not sure what we would find out there. Uh, but what we would find is there's a lot of different words in the English language that mean that. And I think we could find a NASB that said kill when it actually was murder. But usually murder involves killing somebody. So kill is not wrong. You would want to uh, dig in, find out, you know, what exactly do we mean kill? It wouldn't, you wouldn't even have to read Hebrew. I mean, doing some Hebrew would be nice. Having a strong concordance would be nice. But all you would have to do is that God says, you know, really in the same context of Exodus, he tells them how to kill their sacrifices. So you begin to say, well, instead of just blaming the King James for being loaded with error. Maybe I should recognize that language has to be taken in its context. Kill is sometimes a chipmunk. Kill is sometimes, you know, going to end up on uh, Nightline. The murder mysteries. That's not an, it's not an error. It's the human, it's the English language. Let, let's, let's, let's go ahead. I'm going to uh, check out the uh, definitive record of the English language right here. And let's, let's start out with the word kill. Uh, and we need a, we need a verb here. Uh, here's, here's kill, the verb, the full entry. Okay. Uh, past tense and participle killed. Okay. Uh, here's the etymology of obscure origins not found in cognate languages. I don't know exactly what that means, but I can tell you if it's got some obscurity to it, it's got a broad meaning in its etymology. Uh, if in Old English, its type would be, um, let's call that Kilian, conjecturally referred to as Old uh, Germanic Kuljan, uh, and, it, and it goes on, there's the Old English, Quell, the original sense is against this, known first, and you know, see, it goes through all of this. Uh, uh, the usual Scots form in the 15th, 16th century was kel, kil, a vowel difficult in Middle English. The past tense and past participle varied between uh, the spelling. Uh, okay, to strike, to hit, to beat, to knock. Got that? to, uh, excuse me there, to cast, to throw out, to kill, to put to death, to deprive of life, to slay, to slaughter. In early use, implying personal agency and the use of a weapon, later extended to any means or cause which puts an end to life. So, you know, this, this right here might say something. Let's see, where, where is it? In early use, in early use, apply, implying personal agency and the use of a weapon later extended. You might be able to, uh, to argue that they were using it for the time there. So my, my point is to, here, I'll speak to your friend a moment. Nicholas's friend. Let's see. Let's, uh, let's call him. Uh, 
He's uh, from Chicago. Uh, let's call him uh, Leonard. Leonard. It's a fictitious name. Leonard? You want to argue the King James is riddled with error because that should have been murder? I have some advice for you, Leonard. Leonard in the Chicago area, I would suggest you get a more robust argument. That is a sixth grader argument. It's a sixth grader because it's linguistically uninformed. I would like for you to argue it robustly because I like robust arguments. I want an argument that says, stop, dead in your tracks, deal with this. I don't want, well, it should have been murder, not kill, even though kill is to murder. Murder is to kill. Kill means murder. So. Leonard, get a, get a robust argument. Especially if it's loaded with errors, then you got a better argument than that one. I don't, I don't know. Let's, let's, let's go ahead and do a little uh, text comparison here. I only have, yeah. Uh, so NASB, ESV, and NIV all go with murder. Um, but let's here's here's the NASB on the right side of the screen. What I'm doing is pulling that particular word up in the no, this is the New International Version. Uh, in the NIV. And look there, the NIV, Numbers chapter 23, 27, they used kill. And it should have been murder. The NIV is riddled with error. Well, I think it is, but I wouldn't use that argument. I would, I would put my six bucks on it that every single one of those translations you'll be able to find because there's a wide variety to kill, to slay, to slaughter, to exterminate, whatever. There's a wide variety of words in the English language. Is it wrong because you use this word and not that word? No, it's not wrong at all. So Leonard, come back with a more robust argument. I would love to. Uh, Love to take that. I see, um, I see you all are talking about how hot it is in various places. Texas has been, oh yeah, there's Randy. Heat index in Corsicana at 4 p.m., 107 degrees in the shade. That's, this is not good. Um, not good at all. Let's see. There's my house right now. I don't know if you can see that. 63 degrees. 63 degrees. But we're, we are going to get up to a high of 71, ladies and gentlemen. 71. I don't know why why you people don't move. <laughs> That's what I don't know. Um, all over the place. Okay, uh, we have a question uh, from um, San Antonio. 
Manny, the other day I was uh, complimenting Manny because he always manages to get, as I mentioned earlier, always manages to get these questions that I will say on the surface look like, oh, Manny just doesn't get it. And then you put it together and you say, Manny just asked the most brilliant question in the world. They're subtle connections. Manny's, Manny has the spiritual gift of subtle connections. It's in there somewhere, I'm sure. Um, and I asked Manny what he did in, in his life. Like, you know, were you an engineer, a bean counter? What was it? He answered. This was several days ago. Uh, Thank you for the kind words. I'm just a simple kind of guy with some college. I was a warehouse man most of my life. And then when I retired, I was uh, driving 18 wheelers. And now I have the desire to learn and love the truth and uh, nothing but the truth. So help us God. Thank you for your ministry. I like that. Now, you know, a warehouse man most of my life, that there's actually a lot of precision in warehouse work. So that's that's probably where a lot of that comes because uh, I don't I don't know I uh, you know our warehouse work uh, our warehouse is fairly small but uh, uh, it's books and developing a system even there developing a system where you can actually know that we have that book and where is it is a lot of engineering so I can I can see that uh, you know the warehouse says well. I thought we had it and here we don't have it or it's over there. And so I ended up ordering more because that, there's a lot of connection things going on there. So I think that's I think that's where you got the uh, got the good connection ability, Manny. But the question is uh, related to a pronoun today. I like pronouns. Uh, you know that I believe we should be uh, persnickety, be ye persnickety about pronouns. And it is about uh, 1 John 2, verse 2. Let's, uh, let's uh, read that scripture first. He is the propitiation for our sins and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. Man, he says the hours in 1 John 2, 2 and the many in Revelation 5.19. They're Jewish people, right? Ha ha ha. So, 1 John 2.2. 2. He is the propitiation for our sins. Not ours only, but the sins of the whole world. You know, I threw R.C. Sproul under the bus a few, a few minutes ago. I do remember one time hearing R.C. Sproul, and he was using this verse, and what he was saying is this verse means, hey, he's not only the, of course, he's a covenant theologian, was, probably not anymore. As a covenant theologian, you believe that Jesus died for all of the elect, and some of the elect are not Jews. So he used this verse to say that John was teaching the Jewish people that he's also the propitiation for some non-Jewish people. And I, you know, at the time, I was like, oh, well, that's way too convenient. Uh uh Uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh. And I took it more in the standard way, our sins, Manny and Randy's sins, but not only ours, but also for the whole world. But later on, I did have to come and say R.C. Sproul was right on that one. He was using it for completely the wrong reasons, but he was right on that one. And Manny is right on this one. Our sins is the Jewish people. The, the, the letter, the epistle here is written to the Jews, and the hour would be the Jewish people. So he is saying, hey, Jesus Christ, our Messiah, has become the propitiation of our sins, but not only ours, but also the sins of the whole world. The writer here is very, 
cognizant of the Pauline mysteries, cognizant of the fact, the fact that uh, God is not counting their trespasses against them. And so he's telling them about that a little bit. So I would, I would agree, yes, the hours here, uh, our, our sins and ours only, 1 John 2.2, 2, that is indeed speaking to the Jewish people. Even R.C. Sproul agreed with me. Now, Romans chapter 5, verse 19, by one's ma- one man's disobedience, m- many were made sinners. So by the obedience of one shall many be made righteous. Now, many suggests that the many in Romans 5, 19, they are Jewish people. By, one, by the obedience of one shall many, the Jews, be made righteous. Now, I at one time held that many or the many was Jewish people. I've begun to question my assumptions a little bit on that because of some passages that I've looked through that uh, that might just be a convenient thinking. But let's look here because I do happen to have my notes in Biblify on Romans 5.19. And uh, if, uh, if you are on Biblify, it's biblify.worshify.com, and you open up this little side panel right there, I'm going to hide that group session and go down to Notes. Well, first, you should go to friends if you haven't done this and find someone interesting to follow. Why? You could even put me, Randy White. So after you find someone interesting to follow, then you would get my notes. You you see right over here under 19, there's a little line. That is for your notes. If you have put a note there, it'll be a little line underneath the number just as it is there. But, but for your friends you're following, it's going to be above the number right there. So if you're following me, it would be above 19. Now, if we go to notes right here and I click on uh, verse 19, well, isn't that a handy note right there? Verse 19 simply reiterates the, verse of, the truth of verse 18. That's the shortest commentary I've ever had on a single verse, ever. Was I, what, was I up against a deadline or something there? Didn't say anything more than that? Well, let's go to verse 18. As by the offense of one, judgment came upon all men to condemnation, even so by the righteousness of the one, the free gift came upon all men unto eternal life. Now, I'm going to click on this verse. The note there is going to come up. There we go. Uh, Verse 18 picks up where verse 13 left off, verses 14 through 17, as a parenthetical so printed in the King James. Here, rather than a contrast, as in 14 through 17, there is a comparison. It was uh, through one that judgment came, and through another one, Jesus Christ, that the free gift came. Note that this does not say all men are saved, but rather that the free gift has been given to all. If it had not been given, then we would not proclaim God's work through Christ as a gift for all. Okay, so I I think here on through one man, many shall be made righteous. The justification came upon all men. So I think it's a little more challenging in Romans 5.19 to say those, those are definitely Jews. I think it works. And if you could solidify the case that the many was always the Jews, then what you would be able to say is in verse 18, he says all men. And verse 19, he says, hey, uh, that's, that includes Jews also, some of us. You could build that case. I, I just think you would have a lot of work to build that case. So on 1 John 2.2, 2, I, would, I would give it a thumbs up. I would say, yeah, I don't see any other, any other way there. Romans 5.19, you could go either way, but I'm not sure it's as, as explicit as I once would have taken it to be. So probably if you had asked me, I don't know, a year ago, uh, that question, I would have, uh, I, I would have said yes to both. Now I'm going to say yes to First John two two, uh, maybe on Romans five nineteen. Good, uh, good thought.
Edith in Missouri has a uh, question, or oh, also a Romans question, Romans 9, 28. Oh, I got a note on that one too. For he will finish the work and cut it short in righteousness, because a short work will the Lord make upon the earth. The work, the short work mentioned in Romans 9.28, Edith says, uh, is that the same as the days mentioned in Matthew 24.22, Mark 13, verse 20? And that would, that, those passages would be about cutting the days short for the sake of the elect. Um, yes. There's, there's the thin possibility, but this makes no interpretive difference, really. There's the thin possibility that Romans 9, 28 could be that and a little bit more. Because Matthew 24, 22 is probably just talking about the days of the tribulation, where perhaps you could include in the Romans 9, 28, the second coming, the judgment, some of the things that uh, take place immediately after the days of the tribulation. So, but nonetheless, it would still be in the same category. So maybe Romans 9.28 is just a bit more broad, but it's certainly the, the work that takes place in the future. It is a prophetic work, not a mystery work. Therefore, Romans 9.28 is not talking about what God is doing today in the uh, age of grace. This is a quote from the Old Testament, Isaiah, I believe. And Isaiah was talking about the future, but not the future of the church. He was talking about the future of Israel. And that's exactly what, what Jesus was doing in Matthew 14, 22 and Romans 13, excuse me, Mark 13, 20 as well. So is the work mentioned in Romans 9, 28 uh, uh, a short work? Is that uh, the same work as Matthew 24, 22? I'd say yes, absolutely. Uh, and uh, he, will, he will cut it short is the word that's used there. It's kind of a violent word. It's to, I don't have a knife here on me, but uh, it is to shoop, that, that, that kind of word. You know, shoop, there you go. So uh, that... Is, it's the idea of, boom, when it happens, baby, it's going to happen fast, is the, the idea behind that word. Thanks, Edith, in Missouri. Jennifer, good to see you from uh, Yakult. Jennifer in Yakult, Washington. What was an example of taking the Lord's name in vain back in the days of Exodus 20, verse 7? Second Ten Commandment question of the day. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. What was an example of that? Let's... Let's, let's try something here. Uh, the, vain, vain meant, uh, emptiness. Don't, don't take it in a worthless, empty manner. Let's see here if cross-references, if we get, um, If we get any cross-references for Exodus chapter 20, verse 7, see if we can find if perhaps there is a, uh, a good example of doing this. Uh, ye shall not swear by my name falsely, neither shall thou profane the name. That's Leviticus 19.12 is, is really a stating of the Ten Commandments, so it's it, add, it magnifies it a little bit, gives a little commentary on it. So swearing by, ni by, by, by my name falsely or profaning 
my name. Maybe there you could say bringing God in when God's not there. That would be swearing by his name falsely. Or maybe that means swearing by his name and then not carrying out. That might be an example. Uh, profaning. Again, making, making the name cheap, perhaps. Blasphemy. Here's uh, Leviticus 24, 11. The Israelitish woman's son blasphemed the name of the Lord and cursed. Uh, okay, here's a, here's a Deuteronomy 10, 20. Interesting. You know, it says you are to swear by his name. Thou shalt cleave unto him and swear by his name. Probably you could build a good case to say, again, as I already mentioned, you swear by his name, you don't do it. That's, that's using the Lord's name in vain. Um, yeah, here's, here's oaths and swearing by these particular oaths. Uh, here's okay. Saul slew the Gibeonites, but he had a they, the, the the children of Israel had made a an oath under the Lord's name with the Gideonite Gibeonites. Uh, Pay thy vows unto the Most High. I'm going to assume these particular cross references are valid. I would want to check that if I was doing a sermon or a book or on it or something. But it looks to me like it's the idea of bringing forth the Lord's name as, can I, can I say it this way, bringing forth the Lord's name as collateral and then never, never following through is probably the idea. So looking for an example, again, it would be the one who promised based upon the Lord's name and yet then never came back and, and paid the bill. That would be using the Lord's name in vain. That, that indicates, by the way, a society of morality. And it, 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 that's the kind of society that uh, Western civilization used to be. That you could, you know, say, I swear by the hair of my chinny chin chin. And they would take that because, hey, he, he put his word on it. Even, you know... I think George Washington's the one that started uh, in the oath of office, uh, adding the word, so help me God. You know, the chief justice makes him swear that he's going to defend and protect the Constitution of the United States from all enemies. And at the end of that, George Washington said, so help me God. And since then, I think probably all the presidents have said it because that was, that was Western civilization. Some of them needed God's help. Uh, but that being the basis of Western civilization, if you swore by God's name and didn't come through with it, that was a big, big, big deal. Not just for the, for the parties involved, but really for the health of society. So when God lays the foundations for a social order as he did in the Ten Commandments, that's of utmost importance. Now, how is that compared to how we view taking the Lord's name in vain today? I, you know, I think we've, uh, well, I think we, we, we have already moved away from any kind of word-based trust system, which is why our society can't make it in the end. Uh, you, you know, you buy anything today, you got to sign 14 documents and Give them your DNA, you know. 
so so we don't even have the same basis of thought that they or Western society had always had. A man's word. And since a man's word is nothing, I mean, you don't do anything on a handshake anymore. In, in a legal sense. There's, there's still a lot of doing on a handshake and a, on a one-on-one on a -on -one basis because there's those leftovers of Western civilization. But... But that, that just, you know, it was the idea of saying, hey, we can trust one another. We have the same value system. We believe in an almighty God. We call God into this matter and we bring that up. That's how it was used. Now today, because we don't have any of that, the only way we view not taking the Lord's name in vain today is, uh, you know, having it as a kind of a cuss word. And... Whereas, whereas I, I don't think you should use the Lord's name in a kind of that flippant, vulgar type issue. Uh, let me, let me say, I think that was the least of Randy, of Randy's. I think that was the least of God's worries. He wanted a society in which word meant something and was based upon what later we would call a Judeo-Christian worldview. A recognition that there is a God and you do not go up against God. Therefore, if you bring God's name into it, you better move heaven and earth to make sure you follow through on that oath. And that, I don't know if I said all this very well, what I'm trying to say is, we don't even have a society in which you could do that anymore because we've already lost Western civilization. Therefore, the only thing we can, evangelicals, for example, can do it is, is to take it as cursing. You, you could argue that cursing with the Lord's name would go into that category. And I probably wouldn't have too much of a problem with you. I, I just think that's so like icing on the cake. It's so, so incidental to the whole thing that um, it just doesn't get to, to the heart of the issue. I've got a question, I'm out of time, but I've got a question from Vladimir that I uh, missed yesterday. My apologies uh, from that, or actually Friday. I will get to that. I'll put that uh, up first tomorrow. We'll start in. Start with a Vladimir. Good to see you. Uh, and uh, good to see all of you from all around the world. I'm glad you are here with us today. It is a delight to uh, get you a Vegas elegance tie. Uh, that, you know, if nothing else, get you a blue suit, a white shirt, and a Vegas elegance tie, and they'll know when you have come into the room, which isn't a bad thing. It's kind of good. Looks sort of Ukrainian too, doesn't it? <laughs> thanks for uh, thanks for being here, each one of you today. Uh, always a delight. Would love to see you in Branson, Missouri, September one through four. Right division issues and answers. We're going to have a great time there, I think. And the registration comes with tickets to see us. Seeing you tomorrow for Ask the Theologian and for the Gospel of Mark tomorrow.